Bingo. It's Think Tech Hawaii. It's the 12 o'clock block. It's uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. A visit with Commissioner Jenny Potter. And guess who was on the show? Commissioner Jenny Potter. Don't be surprised. And Mark, Marco Mangelsdorf uh, joins us from Hilo. And he's going to... Uh, Jenny Potter, are you here or in Maui? I'm in Maui. Okay. All right. We just want to know. We want to know everybody is. We have a list of all the cities we deal with. Huh? And um, <laughs> Marco Mangelsdorf, you know, he joins us from, from Hilo. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Marco. Good morning. Hey there, guys. We span the state, you know, across three counties. Uh, so it's uh, just uh, it's wonderful to be back with two of the favorite people in, in my world, uh, especially on a Monday with uh, my dear friend Jenny Potter and my dear friend Jay Fidel. So it's been a while since the three of us have... Uh, populated the screen so thank you so much for joining us jenny it's uh it's just always a special treat for for both of us uh all three of us to, to have you together uh, us together again so let's let's take uh the, the dive right into it uh an energy subject which has been getting a lot of play uh, both here in the state of hawaii and also on the mainland is the capital a energy storage system which has been generating quite a bit of press as of late and just a little bit of quick background. So we've got the largest power plant in the state of Hawaii, which is the AES coal plant on Oahu that is scheduled to shut down once and for all and for good and more ways than one by September of next year. And there's a, a need uh, to get additional generation in some form or fashion when AES goes down, when AES goes off, right? That's a matter and of statute, right, Marco? Well, the, the legislature, legislature got the involved. Legislature the legislature got involved. Yeah. The governor's got involved. There's a task force that is involved. So this is very high profile, right? Yeah. yeah. And there have been delays about getting utility scale solar and storage online. And one of the solutions, solutions kind of in quotation marks, is a very large battery. A very large battery that, if installed, would be one of the largest in the country. It'd also be one of the most expensive in the country. And uh, the commission with uh, Jay Griffin, Jenny and Leo Asuncion have been very explicit in their concerns over the months, if not longer, about various uh, issues and challenges regarding this battery. And it's kind of come to a head. It is coming to a head. It is still at a head. So with that intro, Jenny, uh, bring us up to speed, please, from your perspective and uh, what, what's been going on and what to expect uh, going forward with KES. Thank you, Marco. It's great to see you. It's great to see Jay. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I want to begin with expressing that the opinions I express here are my own and not that of the Public Utilities Commission. So I want to make that pointedly clear. So anything that it, it absolves their, their responsibility for anything I express today. Um, so so in terms of the Capital A battery project, this is this is a project that I have held in high reservation um, since the beginning, and primarily because of the cost to the ratepayer um, and the extent of which fossil fuels would be utilized in order to power the battery over the long term. And so the, a, the in fact, we found, and based on the data that was provided from the utility, we found that the dispatch schedule for the battery actually would remain the same over the next at least three years. So it would still be utilizing fossil fuel, not renewable energy um, in order to charge the battery. And that is a great concern to the, to the PUC and certainly to me as an individual. Because obviously when we're, re we're actually retiring a plant that's based on fossil fuel, we want to ensure that it's, it's renewed it's renewable energy that's now replacing it. And that's not the direction that we're going. So, so very disruptive to the goals for the state of Hawaii in terms of where we're trying, what we're trying to achieve. And what we found is that there has been very little um, uh, planning that has gone into, into uh, trying to replace the AES facility uh, in regards to um, other alternatives that could be renewable alter uh, renewable energy alternatives or that could be um, demand side alternatives. Uh, what we were positioned with in the last two years or about one year now was this battery being sort of the holy grail 
of, of the alternative to the AES facility. And the companies have not demonstrated through the record that's on, on file now in our records that, that there are other sustainable options to the battery. And so looking at the cost of this battery, uh, it, it's, it's, it's approximately half a billion dollars over the course of 20 years. However, it doesn't seem that the battery would be necessarily utilized or useful to the grid for anything longer than the next four years. So we're talking about after we have installed stage one capacity from solar and batteries um, for, to the island of Oahu, and then also stage two RFP renewables. So all of these are storage plus battery uh, plus PV um, uh, on the island of Oahu that could potentially replace the whole battery in, in, in entirely. And so in, in looking at that, it's, it's really disruptive to think that if some of these projects would have come online sooner and on schedule per the stage one RFP, then, then we would not have the need for such an expensive battery to replace that capacity from AES. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very frustrating situation for the commission. I'm sure it's very frustrating for the companies as well um, that we can't see these projects come online timely and in a way that would actually replace the capacity and energy needs that were necessary to replace AES. And now we're left with this very expensive battery that in in the filings from the consumer advocate has estimated that it would be about 19 cents per kWh. And that's just the cost of the battery. That's not the cost of actually charging the battery for the energy that would be released. So if you add on the incremental cost of generation at, you know, at margin, um, it, it could be anywhere from 30 to 40 to even 50 cents depending on when that's actually charged and the demand on the grid. So it would make it literally the most expensive resource that Oahu has ever seen. I mean, most expensive uh, generating plant, or it's not non-generating, the most expensive plant that we have on Oahu. And so it's been very difficult for the commission to come to terms with the fact that we have to balance keeping the lights on, and as an alternative of allowing there for be, to be um, a potential for blackouts and brownouts through, across the Oahu service territory. In particular, um, I, 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 we're looking at um, September, October, November of being very vulnerable months when the temperatures are very high, the trade winds are very low, and we see a lot of energy consumption. Those are the times when we would potentially see a blackout. And the probability of that is significantly higher now without AES than it would be with, with AES still online. So the alternative to not approving a battery um, is truly, you know, do we allow for brownouts and blackouts on the grid in Oahu, or do we permit this battery to come online and allow, you know, there, for there to be adequate capacity and so it's been a very difficult balancing act for the commission to understand of, of, you know, really trying to balance consumer interests as well as the needs of the grid and in order to find some sort of harmony between, you know, each of those components and in delivering sort of the energy services that we are necessary for Oahu at this time. You know, it reminds me of Charles Dickens and the ghost of Christmas future. <laughs> So if, um, if you look down the path, it sounds like a dilemma either way you go. If there is a battery, there's an extraordinary increase in, in uh, expenditure and, and therefore uh, ratepayer expense, you know, mm -hmm. electric bills. And if there is no battery, then you run the risk of um, lights out. Um, right. What a combination of possibilities. So my question was going to be, what happens in the in the ghost of Christmas future? I, I, I think I now know, but how do we get here? How do we get to this point of dilemma? Well, um, in my opinion, only being on the commission for three years, having seen no resource plan 
during that three years in order to replace AES, having nothing communicated to the commission in terms of what was going to be the replacement energy capacity um, uh, until you know the second RFP was issued where the commission actually instructed the utilities to increase the capacity and the energy requirements for the um, in order to replace the AES capacity. Um, this wasn't something that the, the companies had done originally that they when they proposed the RFP. Um, and you know, ultimately, I think from the clean energy initiative that occurred in what 2010, 2011, um, that there was there was we were on notice. You know, we were on notice to know that this plant would be retired. So, is there any reason that in 10 years there wasn't adequate planning other than saying you know a storage facility would be the one that would be required in order to replace this? I, I don't I don't believe that to be the truth. I um I, I have a very hard time believing that. So that's that's what got us here today is I believe like a very inadequate planning on behalf of the companies. And um and we are in a position now that we have this resource that thankfully came to pass, you know, so that we can ensure that the lights stay on. But ultimately leading up to this point, Jay, I I would I would say that it was um you know that it was inadequate planning on behalf mm -hmm. of the utility. So what's what's the status? I mean, there's plenty in the press about this, uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know, um, it's it's it seems like it's pretty uh, aggravated right now in terms of um, the the conditions that the PUC imposed were unacceptable to the utility. The utility um, uh, said they could not operate under those conditions and made a motion for reconsideration and. Only uh, uh, one business day ago, am I right? Um, yep. The the, uh, P the PUC uh, issued an order on the on that reconsideration, reconsidering in part. But can you can you talk about the status and and um, you know where where it sets up right now and where it goes from here? Yeah, absolutely. So so ultimately, what we did when we looked at the motion for reconsideration is we evaluated the four conditions that the companies had um, taken opposition to. Um, and the first was really actually fairly easy for the commission to reconsider. Um, we agree that, you know, that, that looking at the PEM, this was for the, the performance incentive mechanism for the phase one um, renewable energy projects to come online. And it was about incentivizing them to um, utilize the renewable energy from those projects over the course of several years. Um, the PEM was focused on the initial year. Uh, and and so when when we reevaluated that, we said, you know, yes, that makes sense to reevaluate that condition. Um, what we would like to do instead, and what we had already initiated, was a mechanism to allow for the commission to evaluate how much energy savings, how, what are the savings to ratepayers that are foregone as a result of the delays of the renewable projects. So we opened up a specific proceeding to evaluate that because these delays are real. And every time when you think about every day and every year and every month that goes by that these projects are not brought online, customers are facing a higher utility bill because they're, pace, they're facing the volatility of fossil fuels and, and essentially the O&M and the overhead from the utility um, in order to, to provide these services under a certain set of conditions, which are basically to generate from their fossil fuel utility from their entities. Um, and so, so when we look at what the savings would be for the renewables, there's a huge discrepancy. I mean, it can be 10 to 15 cents per, per KWH. And so we're actually actively tracking the, those savings that are lost to consumers as a result of the delays there. And we're just tracking them for now. And then what we'll do is we'll evaluate them at the end of a certain period and we'll determine whether they were, whether they're in the interest of the consumer or whether they were real and prudent in the interest of the utility. And then the other mechanisms, what we looked at was how can we take these up in, an, in a way that will be beneficial to consumers in the long run and really determine that those that we had identified within the proceeding um, within the, the AES proceeding were better served within other proceedings such as the CBRE proceeding, which is consumer, uh, I'm sorry, the um, 
community-based renewable energy proceeding, and then also the distributed energy resource proceeding. So we trans we transferred the responsibility of those issues, if you will, of opening up grid constraints into those proceedings so that we can evaluate them appropriately there instead of having that spread approximately across. The other one that was the most important component to me personally was about the utilization rate of the actual resource of how much renewable energy is being used to charge that battery versus fossil fuel. And I think every single one of us can agree that fossil fuels are volatile. It's very expensive. It's not, it's not consistent with the, you know, our goals here in Hawaii. The carbon emissions are way too high. We burn dirty bunker fuel in order to produce electricity here in the state. So nobody wants that. And that was one of the biggest sticking points for me and this, the approval of this. And so when the companies came back and they said, we need you to reassess this, we, we agreed to evaluate it per the, uh, the ability of the commission to prudently review all expenses of company. And so that includes those expenses that are incurred from charging the battery off of fossil fuel above and beyond a threshold that we identified as 50% within the first year and the first and second year. So we, we, we still maintain, and we have always maintained this authority. There is no time ever in history that the commission has not had the authority to evaluate the prudency of the, of the cost of the companies that they incur. They need to absolutely, they, they have to prove to us that those, those costs are prudent. And so this is one of the, in the times where we said, You're, if, if we, didn't, we didn't state this properly, then we apologize, but let us be explicit about the fact that we have the ability at any point in time to evaluate the cost that you incur, because that's part of our mandate. That is part of our job as commissioners. Well, so where, where does it go from here? Does the the uh, order that you entered on uh, Friday, let, let them continue. Uh, the, uh, what has to happen, if anything? Is it possible for them to just proceed? Have they indicated that they may proceed? Uh, what, 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 where is it set up right now? So what it sounds like, the, the last article I saw in P Pacific Business News, it sounds like we met their expectations. So that they're, they're in a position where they feel that they can proceed with this. So I think a lot of the order needed to be clarified in a way that um, was explicit to the intention of UC and that it wasn't necessarily from the first order. So we had to really work on clarifying that language and indicating to the companies that they have authorization to proceed. However, it's not going to be unchecked. You know, we will, we will be monitoring this from the get-go and we will be making changes to the way that they do business through you know DERs, through distributed energy resources and through the CBRE that we want to see the market open up to allow additional capacity to come onto the grid and to, in a way that's unfettered by sort of the rules and regulations that are currently in place by the utility so that we can ensure that customers are receiving the maximum benefit. The more renewables that we can push on the grid, the more renewables that will charge that battery. And so if we can unlock sort of those constraints that have existed up to date, then it makes it a cheaper environment for everyone. Everyone can benefit from that. And so that's really where, where we're going. The company will follow us through the other proceedings to ensure that their interests are, are, are expressed and that they, you know, that they can meet us in the middle or meet the parties in the middle, and then we can proceed from there. Oh, you know, renewables is so important. You know, lest we forget even for one minute that we're in the middle of a of a, something actually more deadly in, in its own way than than the pandemic. It's climate change. Climate Absolutely. change is marching on, and we all have to do something every man, woman, and child in the world has to do something or the results will be really disastrous. They are being exactly. disastrous. So, you know, it's very important what you're doing and what you're saying. Now, Marco, do you have any questions or comments so far? To me? You. Surely you must be jesting and I do call you Shirley. No, many, many comments and questions always 
And uh, I'm gonna have us all uh, leap into the water and uh, metaphorically swim across the channel to Molokai. The Molokai, a place very near and dear to my heart. And there's some, some, uh, some bubbling going on there energy wise. And uh, I just wanted to get your kind of update, Jenny, on kind of uh, from your perspective, uh, you know, where things are at in terms of renewable energy development. And my take is that, you know, you guys back in your first, one of your first DNOs, I think, as commissioner, you approved a several megawatt project with Half Moon Venture that was going to be solar plus storage on Molokai. And as far as I know, that project is uh, no longer in play. And there is a uh, desire on many people's parts to bring more renewable cost. I always want to say cost effective renewables to the friendly aisle. And uh, I think there are two kind of two, two, two levels in play. One is CBRE. I believe there's an ongoing RFP right now request for proposals for community based renewable energy on Molokai. And a full disclosure, I'm working with some, uh, some folks that may make a play at one of those projects at some point. And then there's also uh, what would be a larger uh, utility scale near the one and only Nico power plant west of Kanaka Kai that would also be solar and storage. So if you could maybe give us a quick update in terms of where things are in play uh, on both those levels, both CBRE and then the, and the big kind stuff, I'd appreciate that, please. Thank you for asking. And you know what's so exciting about this, Marco, is that the, the he, I was invited to participate in the Malakai Community Hui, um, energy, the Malakai Clean Energy Community Hui, sorry, and um, to, to come and to speak with them and uh, so that they could ask questions about the commission, about our process and how a community can actually be more engaged. Um, and it was, it was quite an honor, uh, to, honestly, to be, to be part of that process. And uh, ultimately what came out of that was an opportunity for the community to engage more directly with the PUC and also with the, I, I believe also with the county and with Miko and Hiko uh, so that we can actually start working together to address some of the, to directly address some of the concerns and the needs of the Molokai community. And um, so it's, it, it's, it's actually started a wonderful, um, dialogue, I think, the, between uh, the commission and those parties. And, and certainly, I know Miko has been involved in, over there for a number of years and has a very aggressive goal of 100% renewable. Um, I think that date has passed, um, that they, they had hoped for that renewable to be online. Um, and in terms of Molokai New Energy Partners, I just want to confess that I concurred with that order, so I wasn't actually, I didn't necessarily approve it, but <laughs> just, um, and, and one of the reasons my concerns about that was the cost to the community, you know, and looking at really, uh, is this a renewable project that is going to be viable? Is it something that's going to help the community out? Is it something that's going to be in the, the, the best interest of um, over 20 year period? Uh, to 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 deliver renewable and clean energy to the consumers and and you know to, to my mathematics it, it just didn't pan out so ultimately when it, when it, what we've been trying to do and even meeting with with the community is to show them you know the the cost of avoided energy for example that that the the companies provide a monthly detail of the cost of avoided energy and specifying exactly that that cost really is, is sort of the avoided costs that they want to kind of, they, when they think about a project, they want to come in under that cost, you know, and, and really sort of this educational process of how Pico moves and, 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 and thinks about how they procure energy and how they burn energy and how, where it comes from. And for Molokai, it's obviously one of the most expensive places in the world. It really is. It's, it's a remarkable, awful ordeal. And so you think about how can we alleviate some of the stress on a, comp on a, on a community that is, you know, that, that is not economically, uh, you know, advanced, that, that doesn't have the sustainability that, that other islands do, that are reliant on diesel fuel constantly in order to provide energy, have common, commonly experienced outages, have issues at the end of the line with voltage support and frequency. I mean, these are all really serious concerns on how we deliver energy to these communities. And, and really when we start talking to them, 
what they want is a voice at the table. They want to actually have an opportunity to weigh in of like, what are the criteria that you're asking for within these RFPs? Will they fit into our community? And, and ultimately, what, you know, is our self-build options the right options for Molokai? Are these the things that we should be considering? And how, do, how can we understand that there will be fair and equitable evaluation of these types of projects when they come to Molokai? And so, wow. I mean, what an opportunity for this PUC to really hear these people out and to bring them to the table to have a conversation with the companies and with us present to hear what it is that they want. Because when exactly have we as government officials and in the government, and it just the government in general, really given the time for the community to speak up and to provide information and valuable you know, insight into what it will take in order to make their community happy, whole, and, and healthy. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. And so with the, the upcoming RFPs, we hope to have their input. We're not planning on issuing them until we hear from them, not, not at this juncture. We want their input. So, so it's a really exciting experience. Well, I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice and, and just watching you, Jenny, and I'm so excited for you and for us because, I mean, you know, the folks on Molokai, you know, the, an island of about 7,000, and, uh, you know, they haven't had many, shall we say, seats at the big table over the years and over the decades, and I, I, I know it means a tremendous, uh, it means a lot to a lot of people, and especially on that island, to be able to have direct access through you and the commission and to know and feel that their voices, their concerns, their desires are being listened to carefully and not just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, focusing on, you know, the big, the big mangoes on Maui, the big mangoes on the other uh, bigger neighbor islands, right? So, you know, well done guys. Well done you and Leo and Jay and the staff for giving the folks on Molokai seat at the table, really applaud that. This reminds me of uh, the Chief Justice's Access to Justice program, <clears throat> where he takes uh, the Supreme Court to various places in the state, and he holds court in a, in a high school gymnasium, <clears throat> and the kids get to watch how it works for real uh, with the judges and the cases and the lawyers. It's quite interesting. And, and what you're talking about runs a parallel. It's yeah. uh, ac access to regulation, access to policy. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, that that gives people confidence in government yeah. and confidence in policy. Uh, let me also add that, um, you know, it's clear to me that the PUC is one of the most interesting and challenging, um, you know, commissions and uh, governmental organizations in the state. Why? It has so it's like if you look down from from, you know, above, you see it's like a freeway going in all these directions in various levels and speeds. And, you know, it's really hard to count all the ways. Um, you know, you, you have to deal with the people like on Molokai. You have to deal with the technology. You have to be current on it. You have to deal with business interests who are interested in the bottom line. You have to deal with government in general, with the legislature and the, and the governor and the energy office. You have to deal with the public who is so concerned about how much they're paying for, for uh, and, you know, I mean, so many things, I'm sure that's only a small list. Um, and, and on top of all of this, you have to make new policy, planning policy, um, and policy for the future that takes us to our statutory goals. Uh, and and that, that actually is a long way of saying, uh, what about PBR, performance-based regulation? What about that? Where does that fit in what we've been talking about? And cheer up, you know, like we have a minute or two to go. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Minute and a half on PBR, go for it. A <laughs> minute and a half in PBR, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So we're, we are about to issue an order right now on, um, and it, actually I believe it's coming out today on the performance incentive mechanisms that have been finalized through this proceeding, which is, really exciting because that's where the rubber hits the road. I think when we think about uh, what performance-based regulation means, that actually indicates, you know, performance incentive mechanisms. So 
very excited to see that come out. The actual tariffs and everything take effect on June 1st. So that means that this has been, while it's been approved since December, we've been working through the tariffs, we've been working through the, the performance-based mechanisms, we've been working through all of those issues. And so when we issue this order, it'll be effective on, January, on June 1st, and then we will see where we go from there. But ultimately, the whole intention behind PBR is to address a ton of the issues that we've been talking about today. It really is. I mean, it's talking about renewable energy portfolio standards and accelerating the adoption of renewables so that we can move. And so that's one of the PEMs that accelerates that track. We have greenhouse gas reductions. We have electrification of transportation reductions. We have or in improvements, you know, in investments, I suppose, not reductions. Um, and so we have a whole host of different kinds of mechanisms and scorecards that we're putting into place to really inspire the, the utility to perform exemplary, right? We don't, want, we don't want to see just the same old, same old anymore. This is about transitioning away from cost of service. It's about breaking the link from capital expenditures and profits. It really is about making that movement. And as long as it took us to get here, you know, from 2011, when we adopted performance-based rate making and started making that transition, it's going to take some time for us to make the move and the transition to performance-based regulation. And the utility will be, you know, incrementally making those improvements. They're not going to turn the switch and have it happen overnight. And there's no expectation that they will. But we're offering the financial incentives for them to do this as quickly as possible. And so that, that's, that's what I'll say about that for now. <laughs> yeah, um, Marco, we're in a new time, aren't we? Can you comment on that and summarize? Out, out, go, out the window goes the old regulatory compact, right, Denny? That's right. <laughs> and in from the other direction comes the new compact, which, from all all appearances, will be more uh, better focused, better focused on ratepayers and those people who are on the receiving end of uh, both getting the service from the utility company and also having to pay for it, of yep. course. So, boy, you know, it seems like the three of us just scratched the surface and it's time's up, time's up. So, um, you know, there's so many other things I'd like to uh, like to talk about, I'd like to talk about, but I think we've covered a lot of uh, great ground. So uh, I'll turn Bring it back, back to you. <laughs> yeah, well, get, yeah, we'll Absolutely. have to get you back because, you know, Absolutely. there's a lot more to discuss. One thing yeah. is clear, Jenny, you know, you're meeting all expectations for a, a new world of energy. Um, you guys are really, you're, you're in a new chapter, new way of thinking, new way of doing. It's, it's impressive. Thank you so much for your service to the state. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Namaste. 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 Namaste.